Hey, this is Chris from the Ticket Stub. You're listening to Lone Star Community Radio on 104.5 KCZW LP Conroe and 106.1 KZCC LP Conroe and worldwide on IRLoneStar.com. Good morning, everyone. You're listening to the Weekly Business Hour. This is this week's version of it, and I'm Rick Schisler. I'm the host of the show. I'm also a Silver Fox advisor and the founder of OneBestConsult.com. Again, thank you for joining us. I think we've lined up a very, very interesting show. We're going to have John Stacy uh, return. He appeared recently on another show, but we had so much inquiry about his conversation with us about diverse business that we're going to replay it in this show as well. And then we're going to cap off the show with one of our Heart and Hustle uh, interviews that's offered to us by Dr. Patrick Woke at the University of St. Thomas. These have been excellent interviews with entrepreneurs and people who support entrepreneurs. Uh, This particular interview will talk about financing, all kinds of raising of capital, financing, borrowing. Uh, So if you're interested in where you can find money, additional money, a great segment to listen to. So I encourage you, buckle your seatbelts, get ready. And I also want to give you one encouragement before we go to the interview. If you've got a thought, about the show, a question for myself or one of the folks you hear on the show, or you just got an idea that you would like to share, please send it to me. My email address here at the station is rick, R-I-C-K, at IRLoneStar.com. That's rick at IRLoneStar.com. So with, uh, without further avail, let's go to the interview with uh, Mr. John Stacy, Advocoach, and we're going to talk about diverse businesses. Listen and I'll catch up with you on the other side of the interview. Thanks. Well, John, good to see you again. I deeply appreciate you taking time to join us today uh, and have a bit of a conversation about diverse businesses. What a wonderful topic. Well, yeah, I'm I'm pretty excited about it because if you look uh, really about what's happened with COVID, uh, a lot of the larger uh, companies in the country at this point uh, are really not sure if there are companies that they do business with uh, are in business, they aren't in business, or are they still stable? Uh, so it really comes down to really today, want to talk about what the opportunities are, talk a little bit about government and how government does business with diverse business. But then I really want to focus on the, on the private sector because the private sector is that area that's 500% larger than the government sector, which is pretty amazing. Yeah. Uh, wow. I didn't realize that. That is unbelievable. Well, let me ask you, I mean, uh, we're talking about diversity, meaning that we take our business and somehow uh, fit into one of probably hundreds of categories of being diverse, uh, and that makes us eligible or preferred to do business with. So let's talk about, I mean, what is a diverse supplier? What's that all about? Okay, so there's several different groups of diverse business owners. And so when it comes down to it, if you think about it, there's women-owned, uh, minority-owned, veteran-owned, LBGBQ, and then disabled. Uh, so th- those are the primary groups that are out there that are diverse businesses, that they're set aside in the government, and then there's also spend set aside uh, in the private sector. Now, understand, though, you can't just say you're a diverse business, okay? There's a certification process. Maybe we can talk about that a little bit later, uh, but there's a certification process, and that there's a number of different things that you need to do to to get certified. Uh, But one of the key ones is you've got to be 51% owned by that particular diverse group, whether it's women owned, minority owned, et cetera. Uh, That's one thing to know. And just, you know, I spend most of my time talking to veterans uh, and there's a reason for that. One uh, is in the army national guard uh, and the the veterans really weren't recognized as a diverse group until 2014. If you think about women-owned business, they're recognized as a diverse group 50 years ago. Same thing with minorities and and LBGBQ, I think is in the early 2000s. So the veterans have really just uh, over the last six or seven years really been opened up as a diverse business. Well, you know, the veterans obviously with so many veterans in the country, uh, even though I read statistics, they represent 1% of the population. But still, uh, veterans are out there. There are a lot of veterans I meet in business. You just alluded to the fact that you talk to them a lot. So this is a great opportunity for those groups uh, 
uh, particularly again, uh, the fact that I decide to provide uh, my, or set myself up to represent uh, and be a diverse group, get certified, whatnot, that really doesn't change my business, does it? No, it doesn't change your business at all. Uh, what this do is, is opens up opportunities for your business, both on the government side and then the private sector. So again, the business, it doesn't matter what business, it doesn't change your business model. There's certainly some things that people want to know and understand about your business uh, if they want to do business with you, but it's the actual business itself, no different. It's just the ownership and understanding the opportunities that are available for diverse owned business. Yeah, and I think that's something that's very important to the listeners of the program to pick up on uh, is really it gets back to opening up new sources of revenue of sales for your company. Uh, so we're not trying to move you out of one area where you're established into another area. This is just another opportunity uh, to, especially with what's going on in the world with COVID and with some of the challenges. Now I have another avenue to, uh, to bring in revenue. That's absolutely correct. And so some of the things that we do is really help people figure out what they need to do to take advantage of the opportunities. We'll talk somewhat about the opportunities. I talked a little bit about the fact that there's 500% uh, greater annual procurement opportunities in the private sector than the government. And interestingly enough, you see more people that are certified in, to do business with the government. But guess what? There's a ton more opportunity, 500% greater uh, working with uh, the top 5,000 companies in the U.S., so that to me is when you want to grow your business and there's this opportunity for revenue, uh, the private sector really sticks out as if you can, can, if can understand what you need to do, it's a great place to go. Well, now the private sector, like you mentioned, is such a powerful opportunity, really, even compared, you know, I, I guess the beginning of this was the government in some shape or form. Uh, and so it's a matter of, you know, I've done business with the government and some of the businesses I were in, and it can be maddening just to do business as far as paperwork and, and getting approvals and, you know, getting paid. Uh, so people shy away from this, but this private opportunity uh, sounds fantastic. Well, it is. And if you think about it, uh, on the government sector, the, the government sector plans to do these set-asides. The set-aside is saying, okay, I'm going to put this, these deals aside, this dollar amount, and it's 2 to 3% of their spend that they're going to spend on diverse businesses. Uh, what you see, especially what's been happening, uh, not just with COVID, uh, but with social justice and those types of things, you see a lot of, a lot of companies that are saying, you know what, I, I might be spending 5 or 6%, but over the next X amount of years, I want to get that to 30%. And so the opportunity for spend is, is uh, on, on the private sector is, is uh, a lot more. And guess what? Uh, the, the private sector, they buy more products and services and they have far less bureaucracy. And I think you had mentioned that a lot less paperwork. Uh, I mean, there's ups and downs to both businesses and it's all revenue. But the fact of the matter is the, uh, the opportunity on the private sector is just significantly more. Yeah, well, obviously, five hundred percent. That number needs to flash in, in big, bright, uh, you know, letters and numbers uh, to keep people interested. One of the things that you had mentioned uh, off camera, so to speak, prior to the program, is that statistics show that companies that have a diverse business opportunity, part of what they do, they look for that, are more profitable. Talk about that for a moment, if you don't mind. Yeah, I think that that's that's part of the part of the understanding that uh, when you start looking at why people have a supplier diversity uh, program, why they do that, statistics show that companies who embrace diversity are more profitable than companies who don't. It's just now I don't have the stats on that. I just know that that's that's a fact that's out there, uh, and that's one of the reasons that large companies want to have these diverse. Uh, diverse programs. In addition to that, if you think about it, these companies, uh, they really want to take advantage of this. It's a proactive strategy to really uh, encourage everybody in our capitalistic society to be able to go out there and generate revenue. So if you look at it, these companies really what they want to do is they want to mirror the employees, their customers, uh, the communities where the corporations exist. So this gives them an opportunity to mirror that 
and everybody gets to play in the game and be successful with the company in that particular area. Well, you know, I, let me submit one reason I think it might exist is because the people that pick up, I'm talking about the companies that right. pick up on this idea and, and, and try to open up new sources of revenue, such as being a diverse business, uh, are probably uh, smarter, whatever that might mean, right? They're, they're, they're on top of the game and they're pushing and they're making a good decision, I believe, in this case, uh, and hopefully done properly. That's going to turn into, should more likely turn into profitability uh, because it will be reflected in how they run their business as well. Well, I think that you're, you're on target with that, Rick. And I think that as you talk about that, uh, a lot of the companies that are out there, let's face it, they're entrepreneurs. They've taken the time uh, to go through the certification process. Okay. And we'll, we can talk a little bit about what that certification process entails and what companies expect, but they become, uh, they, they, they become a better run organization. And if they're a better run organization, they can help those companies that are, are supported. And I think that that's uh, critical to everybody's success. Makes a lot of sense. So let's talk about the certification process. I mean, I've had several businesses that I've been affiliated with over the years okay. uh, that went through the process, uh, primarily women-owned businesses in those days. As you mentioned, that was one of the first areas that uh, this type of opportunity was very available. Um, talk about, I mean, the certification process. Is it as daunting as we think it might be? Okay, so I can give you some horror stories of where people have taken months and months and months and months to be able to get their certification process. But guess what? They really weren't organized. They didn't have the information they need. Uh, they didn't have their operating agreement. Uh, they, they didn't have their accounting in place. They didn't, so if you looked at them, they weren't particularly a well-run organization. And, and, and so therefore they probably were gonna have a challenge anyway. And so I can, again, a lot of horror stories with that, but then I, I know some people that have been uh, certified, they, they get a list of everything they need to do, send it to the certifying body. And after the certifying body, 30 days later, uh, they're certified. So what's the difference? And, and to me, it's the quality of the company and, and, and the leadership of the company uh, being prepared to do this. And by the way, these large corporations in the government, they wanna do business with someone that's, that's good. And the certification process helps make sure uh, that that's uh, taken care of. And just I'm just thinking of another horror story. Uh, one of the reasons that we're doing these certification programs is there are people that are out there that say, look, I'm a veteran owned business or I'm this. Uh, they get business with the government and then they realize that in fact, they weren't what they said they were what they were. and actually have kind of scanned millions of dollars from the government from the government. Those things happen. So, so it becomes that, that important. And all these companies, again, on the private sector, that's why it's so important uh, that they're looking at uh, being, you know, using certified companies, not someone that just says, I am a, you know, whatever diverse group I am. Right. Well, it makes a lot of sense. Well, John, we've kind of come to the end of the first part of our conversation. If you don't mind, we're going to take a short break. And when we come back, I'd like to kind of dig a little deeper into that certification and see what types of certifications maybe that are out there so people get an idea of uh, how fruitful, I mean, uh, this process can be and uh, a lot of options of which direction to go. So if you'll stay with us, ladies and gentlemen, we're going to take a break and we'll be right back with you. The Texas A&M AgriLife Extension Service has been dedicated to educating Texans for over a century. In 1915, the Extension Program was established under the federal Smith-Lever Act to deliver university knowledge and agricultural research findings directly to the people. Ever since, AgriLife Extension Programs have addressed the emerging issues of the day serving diverse populations across the state. Texans turn to Extension for solutions in horticulture, agriculture, 4-H and youth, and family and consumer sciences. Extension agents respond not only with answers, but also with resources and services that result in significant returns on investment to boost the economy. Join us Fridays at one o'clock for the AgriLife Extension Hour. God's Garage is a 501c3 that repairs and gives away cars for free to single moms, widows, and wives of deployed military. 
You can help God's Garage by donating a vehicle, volunteering your time, or by monetary donation. God's Garage is located at 2106 East Davis, Conroe. If you'd like to learn more about God's Garage, visit our website at godsgarage.org. Or you can contact us and we would be glad to come and make a presentation to your group. Lone Star Boxer Rescue is a nonprofit organization serving Montgomery County and surrounding areas, dedicated to the health and well-being of the boxer breed. Lone Star Boxer Rescue is run and managed 100% by volunteers since 1999. Our main objective is to rescue, rehabilitate, and rehome boxers that come to us from many sources, including local animal shelters, owner surrenders, and strays. For more information about Lone Star Boxer Rescue, visit our website at lsbr.org. Well, John, again, thank you for, for being with us. This is just a, such an interesting topic to me. Uh, it's got a lot of possibilities for, I would hope, a number of our listeners uh, being in the first business. Uh, you know, my experience, I find small businesses that because of the way they put together who's involved, whatever, owners, et cetera, they're a natural for being a diverse business. In other words, they've already got certain qualifications by the ownership and so on and so forth. Others may have to change some things up, but this is something they're just missing. Uh, you know, some businesses are formed, so they fit in one of these categories, but existing businesses may qualify uh, for one of these categories. So it's a missed opportunity if they're not taking advantage of it. Let's kind of dig a little deeper if we can into the various certifications and talk just a little bit about each one if you don't mind. Okay, and so, so we're gonna to have to talk a little bit from a certification perspective about government certifications versus uh, private uh, certifications. Because when you talk about government certifications, there are multiple certifications that you need. Uh, and so if you wanna do business with the VA, you need a particular certification. And it doesn't matter what business you are, but it really comes down to uh, there's a Fed, there's a VA certification, there's a federal certification, there's a hub certification, which is a historically underutilized business. Uh, you know, so there's, you could potentially, if you want to do business with the government in all sections of the book government, VA, federal, state, city, county, you might need five or six different certifications to be able to do business with that. To me, that's part of that thing we talked about that it was a lot of red tape. Each one of the certifications costs money and time. They all need basically the same information. There, there's probably gonna be some twists on, on what they need, but basically it's the same certification. So if you wanna do business with government, you've gotta determine what piece of government you wanna do business with, and then make sure that you understand what you need to do to get the certification. So that's kind of talking a little bit about the, uh, the uh, public sector. When you go to the private sector, it's different because you really just need uh, one certification for your business. So uh, you could be a veteran-owned business. So the, if, if I can provide this to everybody uh, in, as far as the links, Rick, if you'd like, uh, but the NVBDC is the primary certification arm. Uh, is a, uh, a private company uh, up in Detroit, but they do the certifications uh, probably 95% of the certifications for veterans and, and disabled veterans. Uh, it's a relatively simple process, but again, I've got some war stories there because you got to you got to provide them what they ask for. If you don't provide them, they're not going to just automatically move you forward. Uh, and so, and then there's women-owned uh, certifications, which is WeBank, uh, and then there's minority-owned. And again, I can give you the different uh, links to go and look and see and understand what you need to do with that. Uh, but the certification process to me is easier on the private sector than it is the public sector. Uh, not, I'm not saying don't go look at the public sector, just understand that it's gonna take it a little more effort when it comes down to the certification process. Uh, any, any questions of, about some of the certification things, uh, Rick? No, I, it, it, one thing I did pick up on and I hadn't thought about uh, previously is that when you mentioned like the government, you've got different levels of government and you've got the HUD, you got all these different, is that when, if somebody's gonna go after the government business, if that's, you know, or whether it's local or federal or whatever, they need to sort of do a little bit of strategic thinking as they organize all this. Uh, in other words, approach all of them at the same time, but then work on one at a time 
to make sure in your collection of information because I find that one of the most daunting tasks that my clients and people I talk to that go through this is getting the right information together. And mm -hmm. I guess if I'm going to go out and get information, if I can spend another 30 minutes and get this other piece that I'm not going to use on this application, but we'll use it along with a lot of that information. So in other words, don't just take these one at a time and have to start over each time. So I think it calls for a little strategic thinking and planning. Yeah, exactly right. So if you're going to be working on a couple, two or three different certifications, get the applications, know precisely what you need for each one of them, get the information once, and that'll simplify the process and move forward. And when you're talking about certifications, by the way, you just, you, uh, as a business owner, uh, you may be a minority owned, female owned, veteran owned business. Now you've got options because you can get all three certifications and uh, a lot of corporations like that because they kind of get three times the punch for the dollars that they spend because they get it gets counted for each one of those certifications and it may get you in. Uh, there's some companies that are, are seeing that they want to spend more on the veterans, for example. So they're looking specifically for people that are veteran owned. So what it, 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 so there's a lot of different ways you can play this. Uh, and again, I've told you I work primarily uh, with veterans, and we kind of focus more on the veteran space. There's only there's between five and six hundred certified veterans uh, in the, for the private sector at this point. That's it. There's thousands and thousands and thousands women owned and minority owned. So if they're looking for veterans, it's a it's a relatively small base, which is why we're trying to help people get certified, be able to get in into those base, and, and be able to really take advantage of the opportunities that are out there. I'm not downplaying any of the other certifications. I'm just kind of pushing a little bit on the veteran because the opportunity is so great at this point. Yeah, and, and, and you know, that brings up another thought that's kind of off, off the sidebar to this that I've been listening. You know, as we go through ups and downs in business in the business cycle, um, which is just part of it, as you well know, and I know because we've experienced them. Um, if you, someone is really smart about this strategically, they can open up this channel of revenue, whether it be private or government or both or whatever, whatever would work for their business and the products and services they provide. And it has potential to smooth out some of those business ups and downs or you know, bring the ups and downs closer together uh, to weather the storm when it's down and you know, give you a little extra push when it's up. Uh, there's a way to do that, I think, strategically uh, for a small business even. And I think that's one of the neat things about these programs. Again, opening up new sources of revenue, but it's revenue potentially that is a little more durable, uh, perhaps because the government seems like they don't get affected <laughs> or, or very little. Uh, right. You know, how many employees in the federal government were laid off for COVID, you know, or uh, not paid? And I, I've not found one story yet, but same thing in the private sector. We want 30% veteran-owned businesses. And you mentioned the pool is 600 or less businesses nationwide. Uh, that shows that there's a great pool there. And in your particular product or service in your business, there may be nobody. And so you're out there. Well, and so I've also talked to people, though, when you're talking about that as a small business, what business is too small? Uh, because these large 5,000 top companies are looking for people that they don't want to be 50% of your business, right? Because there's a risk to them to do that. But guess what? Even if you're, even if you're you know, a $500 or a million dollar business, what you can do is partner with someone uh, that is providing the service. They still get credit for the spend. Uh, and that helps you kind of grow your revenue. So at some point in time, you can take on larger and larger contracts. So don't assume that you're too small just means that we're going to have to look at things a little differently than getting on directly with that contract. You know, you make an excellent point there. there there's a lot of opportunities here even to go beyond this because I've come in contact with people that have utilized other aspects of this general area of law to enhance their certification and give them more access, uh, which was mutually beneficial to everybody involved. So, uh, it, it, but it takes a little exploration. I don't think you have to be an expert, but I think having someone like you on the team that's got a background and experience 
and connection resources is a real plus. Well, and, and so you talk about that experience and I've been working with uh, uh, a gentleman uh, who's also in the army uh, for the last five or six years. Uh, he's got a, he's been re really working with MVBDC. Uh, he's got, uh, they've got about 108 sponsors at this point. Uh, so he's, he, he's got a lot of contacts. And the only reason I bring up contacts is the process, whether you're a veteran or any other diverse groups, once you have your capability statement, you need to get into the vendor portal, the, the uh, diverse vendor portal. So I want to talk a little bit about capability statements and kind of compare it to your resume. A capability statement is your resume. When you want to get hired by someone, you put together a specific resume for what you are, what job you're trying to get. We need when a capability statement is put together, it's your marketing tool that's going to get uploaded with your certification and a number of other things into the vendor portal. That's important to do. So it's it's critical to get your marketing, I'm going to say capability statement, get that fine-tuned to what you're trying or what product or service you want to provide. That is a key to your success. A lot of people have gotten to the point that they've got their certification, uh, they've put their capability statement together. We can talk a little more about that if you'd like. Uh, put their capability st statement. They've got uploaded into these companies that they want to do business in their uh, vendor portal. And then they sit there and they said, okay, I'm done. Well, guess what? It's not necessarily that you're in the portal. Now you really need to understand what's the next step because you need to get an introduction or you need to call someone in the, uh, uh, in that, uh, with that vendor group because just because you put an advertisement, your marketing out there doesn't mean someone's going to buy. And so it's critical, you know, people buy from people they know, like, and trust. And so just putting something in a, in a portal doesn't get that taken care of. But you've got to start building a relationship with the people you want to do business with. You know, and you make an excellent point there. Uh, again, in the beginning of this conversation, I talked about uh, you don't need to change your business that much. I mean, as far as your day-to-day -day production of product, services, delivery, whatever. Uh, but, and, and that's something that I have seen people get off track. Uh, I was working with a woman-owned business, uh, great business as far as the, the sector, the area they had. They had a great market, uh, but they focused on that, the fact that they were a women-owned business, yet they had access to other business that had no connection with that. And uh, we explored some of that. And it would have been a good thing for them uh, from a lot of different uh, angles to, to diversify, if you will, into non-women-owned business areas. They were capable. They had everything they needed. Um, so it's, uh, we need to, people, folks need to remember, I think, that it's, you're running a business. Now you've got a, a way to perhaps increase or, uh, you know, kind of level out some of the ups and downs, whatever. It, it's, it's another part or way of doing business, but you still need to operate your business and do it the best way possible. Yeah, and I think that that and if I'm understanding you, they may have tried doing some other products or, or just focused on the women-owned business. The fact of the matter is, especially in the private sector, whatever anybody buys, the private sector is going to buy. When it comes down to it, uh, you know, it's not the military necessarily, uh, but, you know, guess what? They buy toilet paper. Uh, they buy water. They buy supplies. So they buy office supplies. If, you, if, if you're selling a product, chances are someone is going to buy it. It's a matter of all the certification does and, and getting the vendor portal does for you is open one of the doors. Now, you've got, to, you've got to continue to knock on the next door, but the fact of the matter is your business can sell anything to the top 5,000 companies uh, in the country, it's a matter of what do you need to do to take advantage of the, that opportunities that we started talking about earlier. Yeah. I, I look at diverse businesses as a way to get started, perhaps for a group, an underserved group or under participant group, but I also look at it as an add on more than anything else. And, and again, not to be repetitive, but people really need to recognize this doesn't solve the issues of running the business day to day, providing quality products, great service, whatever your business does, 
uh, and, and again, I have actually dealt with people that got so off, well, we're just worried about here and we're doing this and they lost sight. Their profitability was off everything. I mean, it's just amazing. But again, those were the good old days, I guess, when all this started happening and everybody <laughs> ran to it, right? It was the newest little thing to do. Well, so. yeah, and, a lot, and a, you know, a, a lot of people run to that next new shiny object and, and you can get, if you're not on track, uh, chances are you're going to lose sight of uh, what you're doing. As a matter of fact, I was talking to a client a couple of days ago, uh, and uh, it's a, a uh, roofing company, but it's all commercial roofing. It's a veteran-owned roofing company. Uh, and they had said, you know, they've been having some challenge with COVID, so they were going to try going out uh, and doing residential roofing. And it took them a couple of months to figure out that that's not what they wanted to do. It was completely off their track. And, it, you know, and they lost time as a result of that because they moved their focus from what they really wanted to do to what they thought would add more revenue. And if they had used their time to focus on this, their revenue would be higher today. But the good news is they figured it out and they made changes and said, OK, we did it. We tried it. That's the good news. And we're not going to do it again. Well, let me ask you, as, as we kind of close the conversation here today, uh, for our listeners, what do you see for the future in this area? Uh, I mean, you've already mentioned that there's only what less than 600 uh, veterans uh, certified businesses dealing in the private sector. What do you see as the overall future of this area in the next five to 10 years? Well, I mean, if you're talking specifically veterans, which is what I mentioned, uh, you know, we're going to have thousands of veteran companies owned, and you're going to see the growth of the veteran owned companies certified grow up uh, very significantly and at some point in time really get closer to where you see, say, the women owned business uh, certifications are. It's just going to take some time. We're, we're 45 years behind them. So it, it, it is going to take some time. Uh, but I think that one of the reasons that that's going to happen is if you think about business owners, and I'm going to talk about comp and the large companies, they love doing business with, with better-known business. And with better-known businesses are generally a little more successful than the norm. Not all successful, but generally more. And why is that? Because guess what? They learn something in the service. Uh, they learn how to plan. They learn to have discipline. Uh, there's, so there's a, they've learned about leadership. They're, they've learned a lot of things in the military that was kind of driven down their throat, but they learned those things, but they're able to successfully take that and move and build their own business as a result of it. Now, there's some downside with that is what we also see when veterans get out of the service and go to a corporation, they struggle because they're used to the way the military is run and corporations aren't run the same. So you actually see veterans that go to corporations uh, start changing jobs after 20, 22 months. So there's you got to look at both sides of the coin, but veteran-owned businesses are much more successful uh, as a result of what they got out of uh, being a veteran. Well, John, I can't thank you enough again for bringing this topic to us. It's been, a, I think, a wonderful conversation and hoping, as always, that our listeners picked up an idea or two and perhaps a consideration to improve and increase their business. Uh, if people wanted to get some more information, you mentioned some links and whatnot, uh, how can they best get in touch with you? Uh, the best way is my uh, uh, email address, J-S-T-A-C-Y, J-Stacy, at Advisor Coach, A-D-V-I-C-O-A-C-H, at thecoach.com. Well, again, thank you. Wishing you all the well and uh, safe travels and uh, good business. Take care. Okay. Thank you very much, Rick. Well, I hope you enjoyed uh, that interview with John. Again, it's uh, somewhat of a rebroadcast from a previous time. Uh, I think it has a lot to offer for many businesses. Now, coming up right after the commercial break, as promised, Dr. Patrick Woke, Director of the McNair Center for Entrepreneurship and Free Enterprise at the University of St. Thomas, will be back with one of his Heart of the Hustle interviews. If you've not seen one of these, you're in for a treat. He has great conversation with great leaders in the small business space from the general area of Houston, Montgomery County, and surrounding areas. So stick with us. Enjoy that interview. It'll be coming up right after the commercial break. Thanks. Hey there, this is Kathy Sanders reminding you about a local treasure 
the new Danville store located next to the Hyatt Hotel in Market Street, The Woodlands. Shopping at the new Danville store, you will find quality, locally produced items for those hard to buy for friends, co-workers, and family members while supporting a great cause. Shop local, shop for a cause, shop the new Danville store at Market Street or online. What is homelessness? Have you seen how parents struggle to find a job when they have neither transportation or child care? What about the children sleeping in cars with nothing to eat? Families shouldn't have to struggle to survive, and children should not be homeless. Family Promise of Montgomery County serves the needs of homeless families and their children. Learn about partnership opportunities and how you can help at www.familypromiseofmc.org or call 936 936- 4418778 Listen in Mondays at noon to hear Conroe news from local nonprofits, businesses, upcoming events, Conroe Park events, news stories, and information that matters to you with your host Margie Taylor of Taylorized PR. For more information about being a guest, visit irlonestar.com/conroeculture. Well, ladies and gentlemen, we're back appreciate you staying with us and as promised we're going to get into that conversation that Patrick Woke had recently and uh, for way of introduction uh, Dr. Woke is the director of the McNair Center for Entrepreneurship and Free Enterprise at St. Thomas University. St. Thomas actually has an, a facility here in the Conroe Montgomery County area. I encourage you if you're looking for education go online check them out or stop by they're right in the heart of downtown Conroe. The interview today is with Mr. Lenny Sazen. Lenny is the CEO of Urban Capital Networks. Urban Capital Networks is a organization that facilitates and manages capital, raises money, investment portfolios, and operates business in certain situations. So Lenny has obviously got a big background in what it takes to make a business work, particularly in the area of financing. So I encourage you to stay with us, listen to that conversation, particularly if you're looking for money, if you will. And another thing I want to encourage you is this show will be replayed in a few days. Uh, We put a copy of each show online at many of the social media sites, and in particular our Facebook page, the Weekly Business Hour. So if you don't catch something, you want to re-listen, it's always available there for up to two years. So re-listen and share that with some of your friends in the business world. Hopefully they would find it interesting and helpful to what they do every day. So please, listen to Dr. Woke, talk to Mr. Lenny Saison, CEO of Urban Capital Networks. Welcome back to Heart of the Hustle with Dr. Patrick Woke. Today we're very lucky to have an amazing business leader here from the community, Lenny Cezanne. Lenny Cezanne, tell us a little bit about your businesses. I know you're currently working with the Murphy business uh, and also the, where we met was the uh, uh, urban, I think it's Urban Capital Network. Yeah, and I think that's really an amazing business that you started out. And really, if you could tell us a little bit about what's going on with those businesses, tell us a little bit more and you inform the audience of what I've learned you know, in regard to your Urban Capital Network. I really think that's an amazing opportunity I think our audience would really love to hear about it. Sure, thank you. Um, thanks for having me. So um, Murphy Business Sales and Urban Capital Network complement each other uh, very well. Um, I started Murphy Business Sales first uh, about five, maybe six years ago now, um, and it's part of a franchise system. Um, I had just recently gotten laid off in corporate America working for an oil and gas company, and it was like my second layoff within two years and at, in my fourth overall, and I realized I needed to do something different. So um, along the way, uh, I, I started out my career as an electrical engineer, and along the way, I got an MBA. And uh, during the time uh, while I was getting my MBA, I became interested in m and And um, I found an opportunity through this franchise that I, I can create my own path to m and So I bought a Murphy Business Sales franchise And what we do is we work with business owners who are looking to exit or sell their business. And I help them maximize the value, prepare for the sale, 
and just carry them through the process from beginning to the mm -hmm. end, all the way from um, actually marketing the business to making it to the closing table mm -hmm. and vetting buyers and, 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 and all of the activities around that. Um, not long after I started Murphy Business Sales, uh, I had an opportunity to uh, get involved in uh, angel investing. Mm. And uh, me and, and, a, and a partner, we first put together uh, a couple of syndicates through uh, SPV, mm. special purpose vehicles, to invest in early stage companies. Um, and we did it once and we did it twice. Um, and then we realized there may be a business opportunity there. Um, and then also what we noticed is that after we invested in these companies at a very early stage, mm -hmm. once they uh, started growing and they got uh, traction and VC backing, mm -hmm. um, it was harder to get an allocation to uh, participate in those uh, further rounds um, after the initial seed stage. So what we did with Urban Capital Network is... Um, we, we formed a, a, a platform and through relationships with venture capital companies, we've created a model where we democratize um, a venture backed high premium type of uh, investment opportunities and we make it affordable, de-risk and diversify for more people to get involved. So typically uh, once uh, a, and a startup company is, is venture backed. The minimum investment is $250,000. Mm -hmm. And even if you have that, you have to know someone to get in. So we've kind of broken down some barriers to help people get in at a lower investment threshold. Um, and now they can participate in these wealth generating opportunities. That's amazing. And you're in your fourth fund, is that correct? Yes, we just closed our fourth fund. Um, and we've done four in about eight mo 18 months, sorry, about 18 months. And they're typically smaller funds. Um, so, you know, and I use the, the term fund and SP, SPV synonymous, mm. synonymously. Mm. So, um, you know, our funds average around $1.5 million. Mm. I mean, the latest one we did was actually... Oh, closer to 2.5. Mm -hmm. So we're kind of getting bigger and bigger. Um, but there are some SEC regulations and things like that that uh, really put some constraints on what we can do. Mm -hmm. And you recently invested in a SPAC, is that correct? Yes, yes. I'm very excited about that SPAC opportunity. So um, we were part of the sponsor group mm -hmm. uh, for the SPAC. And what that means is we were in before the SPAC even IPO. Mm. So we got in uh, and with, with some uh, founder shares and we have some warrants and we were able to open that up to our entire uh, investment uh, network, investor network. And um, we are, we're really, really excited about that. We feel really good about the investment thesis mm. of the SPAC mm. uh, or the acquisition thesis of, of the SPAC um, and, you know, uh, just to give the audience a little bit more color on, on what a SPAC is, it's really, it's a shell company that, that goes public uh, with the intent to purchase a private company, thereby the private company becomes public. Mm. So now we're just sitting back waiting for the acquisition of some company uh, mm. that uh, the, the SPAC is looking to buy. There's probably a few of them out there, but they're, they're, the one we're in is e-commerce um, uh, driven. Okay. Very exciting. Yep. Very, very exciting. Yep. So if you don't mind, let's go back to the, to the beginning where the early roots. I'm always very interested in mm -hmm. how people started out their entrepreneurship journey. Mm -hmm. And I, I hear that you were a DJ at one time. Is that <laughs> correct? Yes. Yes. So, um, you know, I started DJing, uh, probably in junior high. Um, and, um, it was really early, uh, when DJing was really popular. Uh, and now it's, you know, it was just becoming popular. Now it's, it's really popular and now it's digital. Almost anybody can do it. But back then we used vinyl records, two turntables. Wow. And, and um, so, you know, I, yeah, I come from the old school um, when it comes to DJing. And um, uh, I turned that into a business uh, mm. eventually. So by the time I was a junior in high school, I was DJing parties. Uh, I was DJing at school events. Um, and I took that to college with me as well. Mm. Um, and it really paid my way through college, not necessarily tuition and things like that, but I never had a, another job mm. in college. So 
Um, I was having fun and, and DJing at probably some of the parties I would have gone to anyway. Um, but now I was getting paid to be there. Um, and it was, it was really a, a good thing for me while I was in college. And I probably would have never stopped had I not started traveling once I got my engineering degree. And the engineering degree uh, helped lead you to doing IT, is that correct? Yeah, so my degree is in electrical engineering. And, um, you know, I was always exposed to uh, technology through engineering. Mm -hmm. And I started out as an electrical engineer uh, doing um, uh, systems automation and controls, low voltage integration. And um, I, I did a lot of software as well, mm -hmm. a lot of development, so coding. Um, and I did, at one point, I had an IT um, consulting business mm -hmm. um, that didn't last very long. Uh, I was just gaining some traction. Um, I, I started the business while, while I was in New Orleans. And um, just right before uh, Hurricane Katrina, mm -hmm. I was supposed to uh, deliver my biggest project to uh, probably my biggest customer at the time, which wasn't very big, but it was big for me. Mm. Um, and I think uh, I think I was supposed to deliver that that project to the customer on a Monday, and mm. I think that's when Katrina hit on that Monday. So it's just wiped out all of my clients as well as my business. Mm. So yeah, every everything just kind of fell apart there. And then I evacuated here to the Houston area and took the first corporate job I could get. Wow, that's amazing. And and during Katrina, I know, you know, our audience and myself have been through a lot of challenges in my life. But you had also mentioned to me that during that period of time, not only had you lost your business, but you had also lost your relationship. Is that correct? Oh, yeah. Yeah, that was a uh, I mean, talk about, you know, um, everything happening at, at, at one time. So. Um, right around hurry, the time of Hurricane Katrina, mm -hmm. uh, my wife at the time uh, told me that she wanted a divorce, which was totally uh, unexpected. So, um, you know, that was probably, I mean, she had maybe mentioned it sometime that year, um, maybe three or four months. Mm -hmm. But um, we were kind of working towards a resolution. So, you know, at least I was anyway. Mm -hmm. um, and then, like, I think the Friday before Hurricane Katrina hit, she was like, I can't work on this anymore. Yeah. You know, so it was like, oh, OK, you know, I had to deal with uh, an emotional hurricane, a, a physical hurricane. Um, all that once, you know, and then, you know, w once the hurricane hit, we evacuated together um, with our kids. Mm. And I thought that maybe this could, you know, bring us back together, make mm. us realize that, hey, you know, life is short. We need to um, work through this. But eventually, you know, it, it, it didn't it didn't make it. So and it, and it didn't spark anything back. To you. So, yeah, I started I started all over with. with Everything um, from that point on, everything. I mean, I lost everything. I lost my relationship. I lost my business. So I was starting from ground zero. It's amazing. And yeah. you, and this is a really a great story of renewal. I mean, you're a, you can really see in your life, you go from DJing to IT. And even in the worst times of Katrina and in relationships, you're willing to always go back and restart and rebrand re yourself and refine something in your life. Mm -hmm. When you look back in your life, is there some things that you'd want to share with our audience? I always ask, you know, I always ask my guests to share golden nuggets or those, those, those pieces of wisdom when you look back and say, you know, these are things that I want other people to know and, and I, I want them to, to learn from my experience. Is there some things you'd like to share with us? Yeah. One big thing for me, uh, you know, we're going through everything, going through layoffs, going through a divorce, losing businesses. Um, you know, I realized that... Um, you know, nothing, nothing is guaranteed and you have control over very little in your mm -hmm. life. Um, but you do have control over your actions and your attitude and you have to own it. Mm -hmm. um, you can't depend on anyone else to to provide the, the resources you need to to be su successful. Um, there's always people out there who can help, but you cannot depend on anyone but yourself. Mm. Um, and and you have to know who you are as well. Um, and I think um, once you start losing things that you're connected to and tied to, especially something like a relationship, mm. um, you know that that was part of you, and 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 you may lose a little bit of yourself, um, but 
when you know who you are um, and you, 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 you learn not to have to depend on something else in your life to define who you are. And that was difficult for me initially. So once I realized that I am who I am, independent of uh, what I do, who I'm in a relationship with, um, that really helped me to uh, pull my bootstraps up mm. and, and focus on my personal development, mm. which, which I really needed. That's, that's an absolutely powerful and beautiful lesson to share with our audience. Well, I think that's all the time we have for today. Okay. And L Lenny, I want to say a big appreciation to you. Uh, Lenny coming in from uh, Murphy, uh, Murphy Business and Urban Capital mm -hmm. Network. Mm -hmm. And I look forward to seeing you again on Heart of the Hustle. Well, I hope you enjoyed that uh, interview that Dr. Woke had with Mr. Sazen. Uh, money is an important part of every successful business, and hopefully that will be helpful to you in further growing your business. Well, we are at the end of the show. I always hate it when this time comes each week, but I would encourage you, if you have an idea, as I mentioned earlier in the show, you have a thought, uh, you have a question, even a question just about your business, drop me a line. It's very easy. Just send it to Rick at IRLoneStar.com. That's Rick at IRLoneStar.com. And as I mentioned earlier, a copy of this video cast podcast will be available in a couple days online. You can find it in many different places. Go to the radio station's website, and that's IRLoneStar.com, and click on the weekly business hour, and you'll have a copy of the show posted there for your review and enjoyment. And I also encourage you to share it if you get a chance with one of your fellow business people. So the other thing I've not mentioned during the show that I wanted to, and I'm sorry, I took a pause because they didn't want to pay. If you're a local business person, you own a business in the, say, Montgomery County area and would like to sponsor our show, this is a nonprofit community radio station. So this is basically an investment or donation to the station. But be a supporter of this particular show, the Weekly Business Hour. Very simple. Just contact me and I'll send you the information. Again, Rick at IRLoneStar.com. Well, to finish up today, uh, one thing I just have to mention, we're moving into a new studio a Studio, excuse me, uh, in October. Uh, Lone Star Internet Radio, Lone Star Community Radio will be located downtown on the first floor of City Hall here in Conroe, Texas. So it's an exciting time. So look for that grand opening that's coming up very, very soon. Thank you again for listening to our show today. And as always, I encourage you this week, focus on what's important in your business. And we look forward to having you next week on the Weekly Business Hour.